Okay, good morning, everyone. We're gonna start in a minute. I'm just trying to set up the Zoom. It's not very stable, unfortunately. Let's make sure the... Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, I have very Just trying to set up It's weird. Well, can you find the link? Okay, just check if the. Um, I see that. Okay. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think it's time to start. So, uh, first of all, I hope have, everybody has uh, enjoyed a great Thanksgiving break. And uh, uh, we have uh, only four lectures left. Um, before the end of semester. So we're gonna have, <laughs> if you feel it's really stressed for this class. Um, anyway, uh, we have released uh, all the homework assignments and, uh, uh, and uh, the deadline for the, the final project report. Uh, uh, we believe that time should be sufficient, but uh, if you haven't started implementing uh, artificial neural nets, please uh, start right now because the uh, you do need to allocate some time preparing some like fine exams, right? Not only for our exam, but for uh, other courses. Uh, please, uh, so please uh, uh, start doing right now and leverage again, leverage the office hours. Right? Okay. Uh, and the second thing uh, is about the schedule of the final exam, because uh, we have um, uh, we have two students uh, who had who got positive for the COVID, so I don't think it's uh, uh, appropriate to hold an uh, in-person uh, uh, final exam. So uh, we decided to uh, do this uh, final exam online on Canvas. Uh, it's on the exact uh, time scheduled by the, uh, by the school, right? So uh, it's, uh, I think, I believe it's uh, on December 15th, uh, 8 to 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, to 10 a.m., sorry, two hours. At most, and uh, uh, everything will be done online. I will later um, uh, send a reminder to everyone. I will keep reminding you the time in case I won't miss that. You, you should get up uh, early enough to take the final exam. The final exam won't be hard. It's just very some conceptual check about um, the things we have discussed throughout the semester. There won't be any like mathematical derivations and proof and calculations. Uh, not anything on that, but you do need to spend some time going through what we have discussed so far, right? Please take like uh, one day, maybe two, to look at the slides we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, discussed. Uh, that should be sufficient, right? Okay, but we're gonna talk about uh, this uh, uh, in more detail at the, the uh, last lecture, at the final lecture of this semester. Okay. So, uh, so today uh, we're gonna introduce another learning framework, which is called Bayesian learning. Right? So uh, actually uh, I'm a big fan of this because my research area focuses on Bayesian learning. I've done this like for more than 10 years. So unfortunately we can, we can only give a very basic elementary introduction of this, but if you're interested uh, about uh, uh, in-depth uh, content about Bayesian learning. You're welcome to register my uh, class in the spring semester. It's called probabilistic learning. That will introduce a lot of um, uh, things in this uh, uh, in this uh, small area. Okay. 
So before we talk about what is basic learning, right? Let us uh, look at what we have seen so far, right? Um, from the high level, right? So um, we actually uh, discussed the instances about two learning strategies. One is called a uh, mistake driven learning, right? So the typical example is a uh, perception, right? So we, when we run a perception, we just uh, go through the training examples one by one. If we make a prediction, okay, do nothing, right? And if we make a, a wrong prediction, if we make correct prediction, we do nothing, right? If we make wrong prediction, well, we have to uh, adjust our model, right? And to correct our mistakes, right? So uh, in a nutshell, mistake driven tries to uh, minimize your mistakes in predicting training examples, meaning that it, focus, uh, it focuses on minimizing the training error, right? And that inevitably brings some uh, risk that is overfitting, right? Suppose you're Training data includes a lot of noises. Uh, uh, if you over, if you fit the training data so well, uh, those noises might mislead um, the learning procedure, right, and lead to um, the general perform lead to bad gener generalization performance. And then we talked about another learning strategy, which is based on the computational learning theory framework. Right? We call it packed learnability, probably approximately correctness, right. So uh, packed learnability tells us if you want to build up kind of like re reliable estimate of the generaliz uh, generalization error, right? Meaning that the test error on some future on same examples rather than on the training data, you have to consider two terms. One term is of course is the training error on the training set only, but the other term should uh, penalize the complexity of the hypothesis, right? That's what the computational learning theory tells us, right? Your generalization error bound um, is determined by the training error plus some term determined by the VC dimension, right? The VC dimension reflects how complex your hypothesis space is, right? So if you can obtain the same training error, we would like to prefer the smaller or simpler hypothesis space, right? So, <clears throat> Under this uh, guidance, we talked about a uh, support vector machine, right? It's very powerful algorithm that works very well uh, in small data, right? And, and used very broadly, right? And uh, under these two principles, there are various, uh, there are various learning algorithms. Um, and from the learning protocol, right? Uh, we can see the common point, all those algorithms tries to identify a function that produces uh, a label Y for a given input X, right? So if you're doing classification, then the label Y is either minus one or positive one, right? If you're doing regression, the label can be continuous, right? That's uh, what we have seen so far, right? Um, everything can be summarized in these two frameworks. And next, uh, we'll talk about uh, another way to uh, another way of thinking about what does it mean to learn, right? That is Bayesian learning paradigm, right? And on the Bayesian learning paradigm, we're gonna introduce very, uh, two very popular learning algorithms. Uh, one is called logistic regression, the other called naive Bayes. So logistic regression is very widely used in online advertising, right? So there are a lot of, like, there are numerous uh, logistic regression models running every day on your, on your iPhone, on your Amazon account, whatever, trying to predict the chance you're gonna click that uh, small advertisement. Because you click once, they're gonna have a higher chance to earn more money. So this is really important. And naive is, uh, and it's uh, like advanced variant is used to filter the spam emails every day. Otherwise your email box will be filled with uh, you know, fraud, um, trash emails um, all the time. Okay, here's our um, outline uh, for today's lecture. So we're gonna first introduce uh, the concept of phasing learning, right? Uh, what's the idea of phasing learning, right? And then we're gonna introduce um, two commonly used um, strategies uh, in Bayesian learning. 
Uh, maybe you have heard of them before from your statistical class, right? Like maximum a posterior estimation and maximum likelihood estimation. Um, but here I want to emphasize um, uh, Bayesian learning does not only contain these two strategies. Actually, this is two very elementary strategy. Um, the uh, if, if you're if you're if you claim you're a Bayesian guy, you actually want to do some posterior distribution estimation rather than just a point estimation. But these two are just you know point estimations, and uh, but they are most common used. And then we're going to introduce uh, two uh, concrete examples of performing maximal likelihood estimation, which can link. Uh, yeah, if you have heard of these two terms, or if you first heard of the two terms, uh, those can give you some practice and idea about how we conduct uh, maximal likelihood estimation. One is uh, based on the binomial distribution. The other is called normal, normal distribution. And you see that actually the linear regression, least mean square linear regression uh, is actually equivalent to maximum likelihood estimation if you use normal or Gaussian likelihood. So there's a strong link between uh, Bayesian learning and the existing uh, learning uh, framework. Any questions so far? Okay, great. So uh, now let us introduce the let us discuss the notion of Bayesian learning, right? So, uh, or probabilistic learning. So they're basically the same thing. So we're gonna introduce two different notions of uh, probabilistic learning, right? So the first one is uh, relatively more straightforward. Um, that is, we're trying to learn some uh, probabilistic uh, concept or probabilistic uh, target function. So what does it mean? It means that, okay, we're no longer trying to map the input to positive one or, either two, um, or negative one, right? This is our previous uh, uh, setting, right? Uh, we directly map the instance to its labels. Um, but here, when we try to learn a probabilistic concepts, we require that the learned target function or learned concept is function that maps the input instance to some probability. So this probability, of course, it must be between uh, zero and one, right? Otherwise it won't be called a probability, right? So we can interpret the output of this function or the value of this function as uh, the probability that the label one is a sign X. So now I can see the K idea here, right? So we're now trying to learn if I should assign, I should predict this example as label one or label minus one, right? Instead, I'm gonna predict the chance that this example has label one, right? We're learning to predict the chance, the probability rather than the label itself. Why should we use this kind of um, setting? Right? It's actually very important because uh, in real world, like you're always, um, your decision, your belief are always coming with some kind of uncertainty, right? Like you cannot, you're, on the rare cases, you will never be able to say, okay, I'm 100% sure that this one should be like that, that one should be like uh, this, right? Like if you make predictions, you, you always need to give some uh, estimate of your confidence, right? I, I'm 90% I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this uh, rocket launch will succeed, right? Never people, people will never say, okay, I'm 100% sure it will succeed. Right? A similar thing has happened to, uh, that, that's why um, uh, we are motivated to learn some probabilistic concept rather than some deterministic concept, right? This is also important in um, like recommendation or online advertising applications. Why? Because uh, um, you know you know how those advertisement um, uh, decide to show the adver uh, advertisers decide to show which piece of uh, advertise to you, right? It's not like okay, 
I give you a list of uh, advertisement. Right? It's not like, okay, I can predict, you definitely will click that advertisement or not. Instead, they want some like uh, confidence, you like that or not. If their confidence uh, is 100% uh, sure, like very, very uh, high, like 95 or 96%, okay, you might just uh, pick up those uh, uh, advertisement and show it to you. However, if you know that they are not sure this advertisement you're really interesting. Uh, like they only they can only say okay, only like the seventy percent chance you will like it. You might click it, you might buy the product underlying it, right? So <clears throat> then they will adopt another strategy. They will randomly select some new advertisement and show it to you, right? To give you some like refresh and fresh things to st stimulate uh, your curiosity to new things. Right? So this is a well known practical strategy in online advertising, which is called exploitation and exploration trade-off, right? They're gonna look into your history, right? Your account history and see, and try to infer uh, your what kind of people, which things you might like. But at the same time, they don't want you to uh, feel boring about those things to recommend to you. Uh, they're always trying to uh, stimulate you with some like new things. So this is kind of a trade-off. And how do you decide, um, how to decide like, it's time to give you uh, things you like, or it's time to give you uh, something new, right? You have some like, you have to give some uncertainty estimate, which is probability. Okay, this is just a, a brief uh, uh, explanation of, uh, the motivation here, but there are a lot of uh, other applications which uh, do need some kind, kind of like uh, probabilities. So any question regarding this uh, setting? Okay. So another notion is a little bit more uh, abstractive and, and, uh, and, uh, and general. So that is, we're gonna use a probabilistic criterion to select hypotheses, right? So like uh, uh, we know that overall, if we're, doing, if we're doing machine learning, essentially we're trying to search some best candidate in a hypothesis space, right? Each hypothesis might be a candidate function. I want to use my training data, guide me to search the best one, right? So Bayesian learning, uh, another notion, is actually guide this search through a probabilistic criterion, right? So, but, <clears throat> The searching procedure is uh, defined in probabilistic framework, but the hypothesis itself is still deterministic, can, be, can still be deterministic, like a balloon function, like a, a linear regression function, etc. right? So it essentially expresses the criterion of the selection. Right? Um, uh, what's that meaning, right? So we know that in general, learning is to find the best hypothesis from some space H, right? Using the observed the training data D, right? And in Bayesian learning framework, the best here is defined as the most probable, most probable hypothesis. Okay. But how do we characterize uh, the probability, right? What do we mean by most uh, probable hypothesis, right? So it, then we need to uh, define some probability distribution over the whole hypothesis space H, right? Imagine that you have a, like 1,000 hypothesis uh, instances in your hypothesis space, right? You're gonna assign a probability of each hypothesis uh, being the true hypothesis, being the true uh, concept or target function. And also, we need to know the relation between the data and the hypothesis. Like given this particular hypothesis, how likely it will give the prediction in the trained data, right? It will match the prediction in the trained data, right? Of course, uh, the better your hypothesis match the trained data, the more probable the hypothesis is the best one, right? Is the true one, right? That's the idea. So <clears throat> before we go to the uh, details of, about, about this uh, Bayesian learning notion, right? Uh, I just want to, list the several uh, benefits 
Uh, first, it provides a more interpretable learning algorithms because you see that the learning algorithm essentially is a, a probabilistic uh, distribution comp uh, computation procedure. So it is uh, uh, principled and uh, it is interpretable. Right? And also <clears throat> we will see that uh, you can flexibly combine the prior knowledge with the observed data. That means if you have some rule of thumb, you have some own experience, uh, uh, there is a way to introduce your prior knowledge, your experience to guide the search of the procedure, the search, uh, the search procedure. And finally, it also provides new theoretical tools for learning and analyze uh, the learning result. Uh, while this is a uh, meaning uh, in a theoretical perspective, because um, the Bayesian framework allows us to integrate uncertainty um, and uh, the point estimations. So that will give you a lot of like uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, predicts about like uh, how, uh, how, how the convergence what's the convergence rate of the whole posterior distribution rather than just the point, right? So those are uh, theoretical advantages. So now, <clears throat> let us uh, first uh, review the base, base theorem, right? Because this is the key. Um, it is actually the foundation um, based on which we conduct the Bayesian learning. So Bayes theorem is this uh, formula. Right? I believe everyone knows that, right? So suppose we're given two random variables, x and y, and the condition of probability of y given x is uh, the marginal probability of y multiplying with the condition of probability of x given y. Right? So you can see that the direction of these two conditional probabilities are different, right? And then divided by the marginal probability of x. Right? So <clears throat> in more detail, uh, this just expresses uh, the fact that the probability that given the random variable x takes any specific value small x, that the random variable y takes a specific value y is equal to this, right? The marginal probability big Y takes small y multiplying the conditional probability that big X takes small x given big Y takes small y, right? divided by the marginal probability that big X given um, uh, takes uh, small X. Right? This is actually shorthand for this. Right? So don't, don't get confused here. So then let us um, say, what is the, let us look into the insight reflected from this uh, base theorem. Right? So suppose Y is some kind of observation and X is something you want to know, right? Like um, you want to know the actual, uh, the actual temperature today, right? And someone asks, well, why not I just look at, uh, uh, look at, look, look at some like um, uh, device, right? And tell me, and it will tell me uh, the number, right? But actually there is always some measure error there. No, uh, no device is 100% uh, uh, accuracy, right? So <clears throat> then we're interested to know that given, oh, sorry, why is something uh, we want to know and X is the observation. So given observation, what is uh, the probability that your true value taking some value, like what given, given, given the rate of your device, right? What is the true value of the temperature? What's the true value of the pressure? What's the true value of uh, 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 other things? Right? So this actually can be computed in Bayes theorem. So let us first look at P of Y right? in the numerical term. Right? So P of Y, um, this marginal probability actually expresses some prior beliefs. Right? Before we see any measurement, before we see any observation, what is our belief in Y, right? And what about the second term? Second term is also called likelihood, right? So <clears throat> given some specific Y, what is the likelihood of observing 
the value x, like suppose uh, given y is uh, 100, like my measurement is 100.2, right? So I'm, I can calculate the likelihood, right? What's the likelihood that the true value is 100 degree, but your observation is 100.2, right? It is, uh, it is kind of reasonable, right? But what if your true value is 70 and by your measurement is 102.2? That's problematic, right? That is unlikely. That means either your belief is problematic or your device uh, has large errors, right? So, and then we multiply um, this prior with the likelihood on the data and then normalize it with the marginal probability of the data we get our posterior probability. So this conditional probability actually expresses the posterior probability. That is, what is the probability of Y given that X is observed, right? So you can imagine this actually a kind of like a fusion of your prior beliefs and the data information, right? That is, the posterior is proportional to the prior multiplying with the likelihood, right? You got some belief about today's temperature should be, I guess, 80, 80 is too cold. No, it's not 80, I guess it's 70, right? And, uh, and but what you have observed from your device is uh, uh, 83, for example, right? And then what is the posterior? What is the posterior probability? Given you have observed your device rate, what is the true temperature today? Okay. To calculate this uh, posterior probability, um, we just need to normalize the product of your prior beliefs and the likelihood of the data. Right. Any questions so far? Does this idea make sense? Okay. So um, here, just uh, 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 some review, right? Probability, uh, we need to follow the product rule. We need to follow some rule. So A intersection with B, meaning that the even A and B both happen, right? So it can be written as the marginal probability that B happens multiplying with the condition, conditional probability A given B, right? And also the marginal probability of A happens multiplying with the conditional probability B happens given A happens, right? And here some rule is referring to another type of event. So the uh, disjunction, disjunction means uh, either uh, A happen or B happen. So it includes two cases, right? Either A happen or B happen or A and B both happen. So actually this uh, conjunction, the probability of conjunction of the events is larger than the probability of the, uh, uh, sorry, the probability of disjunction of events is uh, larger than probability of conjunction of the events. Right? So you can calculate this uh, uh, probability as uh, P of A plus P of B subtracted P of uh, uh, A uh, union B or A conjunction with B. Right? <clears throat> and also we uh, talked about uh, independence Right. Independence, if uh, two events A and B are independent, and then means that the probability that A and B both happen uh, is equal to the product of the probability that A and B uh, each happens. Right. And it's equivalent to saying that uh, the conditional probability, probability of A given B equals to uh, the marginal probability of A and the conditional probability of B given A is the marginal probability of B. Right. And also have some like a theorem of total uh, probability. So now let us keep our base rule in our mind and uh, keep our uh, insight in our mind, right? Uh, looking, then let us uh, look at the definition of Bayesian learning, right? So again, Bayesian learning aims to uh, decide given the data set, data set B, right? Uh, which hypothesis is the best, right? But in Bayesian learning framework, what does best mean? It means that the conditional probability 
of a hypothesis given the data is the largest. Okay. So P of H given the H means that H, this specific hypothesis is the true hypothesis. This probability given you have observed the trained data. Okay. And uh, if you can find a hypothesis who gives the largest uh, conditional probability here, then we will this hypothesis is the best over the whole hypothesis space. Okay. Specifically, right? <clears throat> let us look at uh, the definition here, right? P of H given D, right? So it is the post is the posterior probability, which expresses that what is the probability that H is the true hypothesis, given that the D is observed. Okay. So now, <clears throat> how to compute? Oh, by the way, uh, to ease the understanding, right? <clears throat> you can view H and D are events. D expresses the event that we observe. The particular data set D. And H is the event that the hypothesis H is the true hypothesis or is the target function. Okay. So <clears throat> then to compute this probability, we apply this rule, right? And uh, it is equal to P of H multiplying P of D given H divided by P of D, right? So let us uh, look at those terms one by one, right? So first P of H is the prior probability of H. consistent with what we have discussed a moment ago, right? It actually expresses uh, some background knowledge. Namely that before we see any training data, right? What is our belief? Or what do we expect that the true hypothesis uh, is H, right? And for example, if you're performing um, some linear regression, right? Of course, each H corresponds to a, a set of uh, the model weights and bias. Okay. Yeah, you might have, if you're highly experienced, you might have some uh, feeling that, okay, I believe uh, this particular setting of weights and bias uh, have a larger chance to be the true hypothesis. Okay. And this other particular set of weights and bias, uh, uh, they're, they're less likely to have the, to be the true hypothesis. Right? This can be, this is actually, uh, can be encoded in, into this uh, prior probability. Or if you don't have any such kind of preferences, uh, maybe you can set P of H to be just uniform distribution. You assume, okay, all the hypotheses in the whole space um, is equally is equal likely to be the true hypothesis. Right? So this is uh, what the first term mean, right? So <clears throat> then the second term is the likelihood. Given this particular hypothesis H, if it is true, right? And what is the probability that this hypothesis, what is the probability that we're gonna observe this data, right? Like take a concrete example, given the, today's temperature is uh, 80 degree, right? What's the probability that you observe from your device, the rate is uh, 80.2. Okay. It is quite likely. Right? <laughs> but suppose, or given that your true temperature is uh, 80.2, right? 80, right? What's the likelihood your rate is uh, 100? It's quite unlikely, right? So actually the likelihood that measures uh, the match, how, how your, true hypothesis, how your uh, assumption of the true hypothesis and the data match, right? Right? So the better H and D match, the larger the likelihood. Right? And then we can take a look at normalizer, right? So the normalizer is actually the probability of the data D right? is observed, right? is independent of any knowledge about the hypothesis. So from the probability point of view, right, if you can, to calculate this marginal probability of D, you're gonna sum over this product, 
right, over all possible hypothesis space. That means they're gonna count all um, um, all the choices uh, of the hypothesis H. So your final value it just kind of integrate all possibilities of H. Right? So it's so that means it, it is independent to any specific uh, hypothesis. Yes, uh, just what I have, uh, I have given you that example, right? Like uh, the linear regression case. But now uh, let me give you another example, like, uh, um, suppose you want to uh, estimate uh, the stock price, right? I have a, uh, my hypothesis space is, a, uh, is a, all kinds of polynomials, okay? So you have a, like, zeros out the polynomials, that means constant, right? Or you have first order polynomial that is just lines. And second order is just the quadratic lines, right? And third polynomial is the fifth polynomial, a lot of polynomials, right? And of course the stock price is, um, itself is very complicated uh, regarding the time or other factors, right? So uh, then you can define a non-uniform prior distribution over those uh, hypothesis spaces. Of course, your, your belief about the true function which can predict the price is not a zeros order polynomial or first order polynomial. It is not likely to be a constant or some linear function, right? So you should put some like a low um, prior probability over such kind of uh, hypothesis spaces. And you might prefer uh, those more complicated polynomials because we know that stock prices uh, are quite complicated. Okay. You might place a higher probability, uh, higher prior probabilities over those uh, higher order polynomials. Okay. Does it make sense? Okay. Another question? Well, of course, if you want to compute, given the data, right? Suppose you have collected uh, like two years. Uh, uh, stock transaction data, right? Stock uh, stock data, right? <clears throat> now you want to refine the probability that a, any particular hypothesis is true given this data, right? You want to com compute this. You have to uh, integrate both your prior beliefs and the likelihood, right? How each how H matches the real data and how your prior beliefs about H is true. You have to merge them together to get this uh, posterior probability. That is what Bayes' rule tells us. Any question? Okay. So these are two notions of Bayesian learning. Hopefully um, this uh, uh, concept uh, uh, is uh, 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 makes sense to you and give you some idea about that. <clears throat> So next, we're gonna talk about the two training strategies uh, of uh, Bayesian learning. One is called the maximum a posterior estimation. The other is called maximum likelihood estimation. I'm pretty much sure uh, many of you may have heard of these terms, right? So just to give a, a, a review. So <laughs> again, this actually, uh, try, uh, this actually uh, serves for the, our aim to find uh, the most probable hypothesis given data, right? That's our Bayesian learning, right? So we can denote such hypothesis uh, in a map framework by H map, right? So how can we compute H map? As name suggested, we want to find uh, the hypothesis in a hypothesis space, which has the maximum posterior probability of H given D, right? Or has the most uh, has the largest probability that H is the true hypothesis or true target function given the observed data D, right? But how can we maximize this? Right? <clears throat> Again, we're gonna use uh, the uh, base rule, right? So Bayes rule tells us this posterior probability is the prior multiplying the likelihood then divided by the marginal uh, distribution of data. So now I want to ask, what does this mean? Right? Is this denominator related to H? 
No, right? Because uh, it's marginal probability, right? You have to uh, integrate all the h to compute this uh, whole marginal probability, right? It's actually constant to any specific h. So that means uh, if you're doing maximization, you, you don't need to uh, consider this uh, constant term. You can throw it out. Uh, so our map estimation is just to maximize the product of the prior and the likelihood. So that's how we conduct max, uh, maximum a posterior estimation. So essentially we never need to really compute posterior probability. What we, what we need to do is just to uh, maximize their product, the product of the prior and the product of the likelihood. So now let us try to simplify this uh, map estimation problem a little bit, right? So let us assume our prior is just uniform. That means uh, you don't have any uh, knowledge or experience uh, uh, like which specific H should be preferred, which one is unlikely to be the true uh, target, right? Then, then that means, okay, let me just assume everyone has equal chance to be, uh, to be the, the guy we want to search, right? You want to find, and that means P of H P of HI equals to P of HJ for all HI and HJ in the in hypothesis space. So P of H actually does not uh, take any effect in this maximization procedure. We can read, we can get rid, uh, get it, uh, um, get rid of it, right? Then <clears throat> our map estimation is reduced to the maximum likelihood estimation. Why? Because uh, we only need to maximize the likelihood of data given the hypothesis space, a given hypothesis, right? This is called maximum likelihood estimation. Okay. Any question? Right. So you can see that actually maximum likelihood estimation essentially is a, a special case of the map estimation where you don't have uh, any informative uh, prior over the hypothesis space. Or in other words, you have to assume a uniform prior over the hypothesis space. Okay. And in a computational procedure, uh, because they're just products, right? You don't, you actually don't want to deal with uh, the number between zero and one. Right? It's very easy to uh, have the numerical on the flow issue. So we, in practice, we always take the logarithm over those those things. We're trying to maximize in the log space. The reason is that you don't have a the numerical issue and also uh, your computation will be a lot easier. Any questions so far? Is everyone comfortable with this or is this a uh, really straightforward? Okay. So now <clears throat> we'll look at two concrete examples of uh, maximum likelihood estimation, right? And to give you a sense, right, uh, how we uh, how we conduct them uh, uh, in uh, in practice, right. So the first one is called Bonoli trials, and the second one is called normal distribution, right. <clears throat> so again, this is a maximum likelihood estimation. Well, um, uh, for each hypothesis in hypothesis space, we can calculate the likelihood that, given this hypothesis is true, um, the data is observed, the specific data set D is observed. And then we try to uh, find across the hypothesis space, which specific H has this largest uh, likelihood, right? So of course, to conduct MLE, right? What we need to do is that, okay, we need to find a hypothesis space H, right? We need to define hypothesis space H. And then we also need to specify a model that says how data D is generated given H. So let us look at the first example, which is called Bonoli trials. Um, it may be on the following scenario, right? You, you got the CEO of um, a startup, hires you for your first consulting job, right? And the CEO give you the question, right? So he said that, okay, my company makes light box, right? Of course, I need to know how, um, how good the quality will be, right? I need to know what's the probability my lab will fail, uh, will fail or faulty, right? 
And you say, okay, sure, I can help you out, right? And uh, you just need to uh, make sure that are they all identical, meaning that you're, they are produced in the same line, right? <clears throat> same manufacturing line, right? And so you say, yes. And you say, okay, excellent. I know how to help. We need to do some experiments. So what kind of experiment uh, uh, can we do, right? So <clears throat> we just uh, randomly pick up like 100 light bulbs produced by the manufacturer, right? And uh, you test each one by one, just to you know, charge the electricity and see if they are working or not, right? And it turns out that 80 of them work and 20 don't, right? And then you claim that the probability of the failure of your light bulbs is 0 0.2, right? It's quite intuitive, right? And then so you ask, well, but how do you know, right? You say, okay, I just uh, divide 80 by 100. I got, uh, I, I divide 20 by 100, I got 0 0.2. Is that convincing? It's intuitive, but not convincing, right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't respond with that. People will say, okay, you are not professional. So now let's see how do we uh, um, how do we conduct maximum likelihood estimation to give you this uh, uh, zero point two chance, right? It's actually the result of uh, conducting maximum likelihood estimation, right? So um, suppose the probability of failure is p, right? Of course, p is unknown. It's something we want to estimate from our experiments, right? So of course, and then the probability the light bulb works is one minus P, right? And uh, each trial is ID, right? Which is uh, reasonable, meaning that they're indeed independently and identically distributed because those light bulbs are produced uh, uh, independently and on the same uh, manufacturer line, right? So our data is the fact that we have uh, 100 light bulbs tested where 80 work and 20 don't, right? And then given any specific uh, failure probability P, what's the likelihood of this uh, observed data? We know that, okay, for one particular set of uh, working labs, working uh, lab, lab bulbs and uh, failure lab bulbs, their chance uh, is uh, P to the power of 80, one minus P to the power of 20, right? But actually we have uh, many, many different sets of uh, working bulbs and uh, failure bulbs, right? How many, how many sets do we have? You have this uh, combination number, right? And this combination of um, 80 out of 100, right? So you got, you got 80. And from this combination, where right, each instance inside this combination tells you which particular 80 bobs are working, right? And uh, then the remaining must uh, be the feeling ones, right? So you have to compute all the combinations. And for each particular set of bobs, their chance to work is p to the power of 80. And, uh, the remaining doesn't work one, one minus p one minus p to the power of 20 right this is just a, a simple uh, probability uh, calculation i believe everyone is uh, has done that before right so now we have defined the likelihood right is actually a multi uh, multinomial bernoulli trials right so how can we estimate p we maximize the likelihood right this is maximum life. So that is the maximum life estimation. We just maximize this uh, uh, data likelihood with respect to the unknown parameter P, right? <laughs> so that means we're maximize this uh, P to the power of 80, one minus P to the power of 20, multiplying this uh, combination number, right? So um, now let us assume a more general framework. We have a, uh, a plus B tests, right? And uh, we have A, Bob working, and B, not working, right? So um, we want to conduct the maximum, maximum likelihood estimation. That means we want to maximize the 
uh, for the likelihood that given P, uh, you have this uh, data D, right? Which A work, where A works, A work and B don't work, right? So as we just mentioned, right? In practice, we always take a log likelihood because we, want to not, we do not want to deal with a number which is very, very close to zero, right? So we take a log reason and the P of D given H, what is that? What's the general form? We have, we have tested A plus B bobs, right? Where A works and B doesn't work, right? What's, what is the, what is the uh, probability of that happen? Yeah, just the copy the equation, but just replace uh, 80 by A and B by 20, right? So we have to, uh, uh, so for each particular set of uh, uh, working, uh, the, the, each particular set of uh, A uh, bobs, right? And uh, the, this, this set of A bobs working has a chance P of A. And then the remaining set of bobs uh, not working has a chance one minus P to the power B, right? And then you have to consider all possible sets, right? So you have to do this combination uh, in front of it, right? And then you take a log reason because you want to take the log probability, right? And if you want to maximize it, the good thing is that although this combination number is uh, very large, it is constant to P, right? So don't need to, you really don't need to care about that. You can just throw it out during the maximization procedure. So you take this, you got A log reason P plus B log reason one minus P, right? So now, how do you solve P, right? How do you maximize the, this uh, uh, formula, this expression with respect P? Any thought? An idea? Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, it is that straightforward. Right? Take the derivative and set the derivative to zero. You get that the best uh, probability is B or A minus uh, A plus B, right? That's how, that explains the intuition, right? You just divide a number of uh, failures over the total number of trials or no, over the total number of tests. Right? You, get the, uh, you get your maximum likely estimation of the failure probability. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, great. So of course, you have always, uh, you, you always need to define a uh, likelihood model, right? Otherwise you won't be able to conduct the maximum likelihood estimation, right? So here we choose the Bonoli model, right? Or actually it's multi-trial Bonoli model. And you could assume a different model as long as you can justify the rationality. So we'll consider other models and see how to learn their parameters. The second example will be related to the normal distribution, right? So again, normal distribution is not something continuous. So actually uh, we're dealing with continuous observations. Again, this is a maximum likelihood estimation. If you want to conduct estimate model, uh, maximum likelihood estimation, you have to define the hypothesis space age. It also, you have to, um, define a model which tells given a specific hypothesis how the data D is generated, right? So now let us consider uh, a more general case. Suppose your hypothesis space H, big H, consists of real value functions, right? And your inputs are vectors of D dimensional, and output is just a real number, right? We're doing regression, right? And I suppose the training data is generated as follows. Right? First, the input of each example, right? Xi is drawn randomly, right? Say uniformly or random, right? And then you got some underlying true function um, to get the true prediction, which is F of Xi, right? 
And then you are not able to, this is often the case in practice, you are not able to really detect the true value, right? So you have some uh, measurement error, you have some noise, whatever, right? So we assume that the value, the observation, right? Observe the value is corrupt, is the true value corrupted by some noises, which we denote by EI. And what is the assumption of this noise? The most common used assumption is uh, just the Gaussian noise. Like we assume, okay, your true function value, when it is detect, when it is probed and observed, it is being, uh, it is corrupted by some noise. This noise follows some Gaussian distribution. Um, we know that it is a zero mean Gaussian distribution because we assume that, okay, this noise is not, uh, it's not biased, it's just unbiased, but you don't know it is, uh, it give you uh, the error toward this way and toward that way. Right? That means uh, your observed output is your true function value plus some unknown Gaussian distributed noises. Right? Now, suppose we have uh, collected uh, M training examples, X, I, Y, I, generated, uh, each of them are independently generated in this way. Okay. And then let's see how we conduct the maximum electro estimation about model parameters, right? So any question regarding the setting? Okay, great. So <clears throat> from our setting, we know that, okay, suppose we have, we have a hypothesis H, right? And uh, suppose we want to H, we want to use H to uh, make a prediction, right? We want to know what is the probability that a particular label YI was generated by this hypothesis as H, right? From the uh, whole, uh, data generation procedure, right? If H is true, right? We know that the difference between the observed value YI and your prediction should follow a Gaussian distribution, right? That is what our, uh, uh, that, that is what the data was generated, right? If the function, uh, if, uh, uh, suppose you have a, a true function f, you give the true value, right? And then your observation is the true value corrupted by some random Gaussian noises, right? So now suppose you believe your hypothesis H is true, right? Meaning that the prediction made by H is true. That means, okay, the difference between observation and your prediction should follow that Gaussian distribution, right? So based on that, we can define a Gaussian likelihood. That is uh, given H, your prediction of H, your prediction made by H, the likelihood you observe YI will follow a Gaussian distribution, right? Okay. And uh, of course, because the, 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 the Gaussian uh, noise is assumed to, have, uh, to be unbiased, meaning, meaning, meaning that the mean is zero, right? Uh, but we do not know some uh, the standard deviation. So this is uh, the uh, so this is the uh, likelihood. So here we get the probability or likelihood. Right? So any question? So this is uh, the density of the Gaussian likelihood. The uh, density of the Gaussian distribution. Does it make sense for everyone? Okay. So now this is for this is likely for one example, right? Now we have a uh, like M examples, right? In our training data, and, and we assume that the training data are generated independently. Right? Then we can write down the likelihood given H is correct or true to generate this M examples as a uh, the product of the likelihood 
for each particular example, x i y i, right? Well, which is uh, p of y i times a given h and x i. And this part is here, right? Then we want to uh, find the most likely hypothesis, right? That means we want to maximize the likelihood of the data given the hypothesis, right? We can imagine that you're gonna uh, look over the whole hypothesis spaces and uh, the whole hypothesis space and look at every particular hypothesis and uh, calculate this uh, likelihood and find the one who has the maximum likelihood, right? That is this, uh, that is this uh, maximization procedure. And this whole likelihood, likelihood is a product of the individual likelihoods, right? So again, and then we, we just uh, substitute this Gaussian likelihood we defined before for this uh, P of YI given H XI, right? which is like that, right? And now I want to ask, uh, how do we maximize this product? How do we maximize this? Any suggestion? Yes, exactly, right? As we mentioned, right, we never, we don't want to deal with the probability because, you know, this probability is multiplied together. You can imagine the number is very, very small. It's like 10 to minus six or 10 to minus seven. Like if you're doing all things in that small scale, it's very likely to, um, to have some numerical on the flow. Right? You either, we don't want to do that, right? So that's why performing maximal likelihood estimation or maximal uh, a posterior estimation will always take logarithm, right? Because you take a logarithm, it doesn't change your optimal. Right? So I want to take a logarithm and then your product now becomes a, a summation, right? Summation over M and the logarithm of each uh, uh, Gaussian density, you know, logarithm E, they cancel, right? You got logarithm of this uh, factor subtracted by this uh, quadratic terms, right? And again, because we want to evaluate uh, which H has this uh, maximum likelihood, right? So the first term is actually constant. We don't care, right? It has nothing to do with H. So you can throw it out, right? So now it turns out to be a maximize this negative summation over all the training examples where each summand is this uh, uh, square error over two sigma square, right? Sigma is unknown standard deviation, right? And again, because this Gaussian likelihood standard deviation is, is positive, right? And you just gather it off, it doesn't change your function optimum, right? So now <clears throat> our objective and also maximize a negative value is equivalent to minimizing uh, the value itself, right? You just uh, uh, take off this uh, negative sign from here and then we change the optimization to be minimization, right? Maximization to the minimization. So the maximum likelihood estimation essentially is to minimize this uh, summation of the square errors. Now, let us further consider a specific instance of hypothesis space, right? We consider our hypothesis space uh, as the set of linear functions, meaning that each particular hypothesis is just uh, the inner product between some weight vector and uh, the input vector. So now our maximum likelihood estimation is essentially to minimize this, right? So have we seen this objective function before? Okay. What's that? Yeah, the least mean square regression problem, right? So when we talk about linear regression, the very first uh, model is least square, least mean square um, regression, right? So everyone has uh, used uh, the stochastic gradient descent framework or gradient descent framework to train the model, right? So now we can see 
by conducting maximal likely estimation, we actually arrive at the same objective function, right? So this actually gave us uh, two perspectives, two equivalent perspectives about linear regression, right? So this is the same objective function, right? Or same loss function or cost function, right? same meaning, right? So the same loss function actually can be explained in two ways. Right? So the first one is the loss minimization perspective where you will each summon as the square loss. Right? You use your hypothesis, which is the inner product, right? To make the prediction what's your error and you take the square of this error as your cost. And you sum over the cost of all the training examples of predicting all the training examples, then you constitute your objective function. You want to minimize the whole training, uh, whole cost function on the uh, the cost function over the whole training set, the training data to find the best hypothesis. Right? That is uh, what we have discussed and explained in the least mean square regression problem, right? But from uh, the other perspective, like from Bayesian learning perspective, right, we have uh, another angle. Right? This is actually can be derived from the maximum likelihood estimation from the Bayesian treatment or Bayesian framework, right? In that Bayesian framework, we believe that the errors are, namely the difference between your prediction and uh, the observation, right? Are normally distributed, right? And this uh, error have zero means, right? Meaning that they're not biased and have some like unknown fixed variance. And then if we conduct maximal likelihood estimation, to find the model parameters W, right? By a bunch of like uh, uh, simplification and right? derivation, you take a logarithm and uh, you throw out some constant terms, uh, you end up with the same objective function, right? So you can see that it's uh, very interesting. So, but this is not, uh, this is the simplest case uh, uh, to show the strong connection between Bayesian learning and uh, non-Bayesian learning. Actually, there are numerous such kind of examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And then it might not be this particular form. So, you know, if you're doing Bayesian, you'll find that you have to assume this distribution, that distribution, all kinds of distribution. And different distribution actually deliver different uh, assumptions. So here we assume, okay, the error follows a normal distribution, right? But if you're upset of that, okay, you might consider some other distributions like you feel, okay, I should uh, put some uh, uh, t, t distributions where you, have, you, you really need to, uh, actually it, it really applies some like weights on those errors. They're not assumed on the uh, uniform weights over each particular error on the training examples. If you if you if you if you switch to like Laplace um, distribution, then there will no there there will be um, there will be no square terms here. It will be absolute term. Right? It will be the summation over the absolute error uh, in predicting a training example. So this all really depends on how you choose the uh, distribution to construct your data likelihood. And on the other hand, of course, if you define your loss function, right? Um, as we mentioned, right? It's not necessary to always define the square loss, right? You can define whatever whatever other loss you want, right? As long as you feel uh, it's rational, right? Any other question? Is everyone comfortable with that?
yeah, in our homework, we, uh, we it's, uh, it's not obligatory to implement uh, some um, maximum likely estimation or maximum um, a posterior estimation. Um, but we do want you to understand this concept because it's, uh, it's, it's really important. It's uh, very widely used. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, uh, actually, that's why, uh, I mean, uh, the maximum likely estimation or maximum a posterior estimation, they give you the, which one has the best probability, but they won't give you the probability itself. Um, but but some like uh, in-depth uh, research, they really want to find the whole posterior distribution, right? I don't want to know which one the best. I, I not only want to know uh, which one is best in posterior distribution space. I also want to know what's the distribution, what's the posterior probability of other hypothesis spaces. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so to summarize, right? So we first introduce uh, the concept of uh, uh, Bayesian learning, right? So um, we have introduced the two notions, right? One notion is uh, quite simple, right? We just define our target function is to map the input to some probability, right? To map the input to the chance that your label is one, rather than to map the input to label one or minus one, right? This is different, right? <clears throat> the second notion is more general. We want to use this uh, probability framework to help us guide the search over the hypothesis space, right? So we use the probability, uh, probability principle, right? And we define the probability distribution over the hypothesis space. We give our prior beliefs over um, each hypothesis, right? We give our belief if this hypothesis is good or not, right? And then we define the likelihood that given any specific hypothesis, how likely the data is generated and then merge them together, right? We can conceptually calculate the posterior probability that a specific hypothesis is true given observation of data, right? This is all based on the base rule, right? Following base rule, you can, you use, uh, you, you can calculate that, right? And then the computational procedure will actually um, talk about the two strategies, maximum A posterior estimation and maximum likelihood estimation, right? So maximum A posterior estimation, as the name suggested, I want to maximize the posterior probability, right? So we know that the posterior probability is proportional to uh, the prior multiplying with likelihood. So we maximize the posterior probability, you have to uh, maximize uh, the product, right? You have to consider both the prior term and the likelihood term. But for maximum likelihood estimation, you don't need to consider for that, right? You only consider the likelihood of the data. In other words, it is actually assuming your prior is uniform, right? You don't have any preferences over uh, the hypothesis. And then we have seen two examples uh, of conducting maximum likelihood estimation, right? One is for the uh, uh, binary observations, uh, we, which we can use binomial distribution, right? And the other is for continuous uh, observations, which we can use normal distribution to define our data likelihood, right? So, <clears throat> and also we show the link between the, uh, the, the, the maximal likelihood estimation and also the least mean square uh, estimation in the linear version case, right? So we can see that they're surprisingly kind, uh, kind of like a, a, a coincident, uh, uh, the same, right? They, they, they reduced to the same objective function, right? Um, after this lecture, you should be able to apply both uh, the MAP and MLE to simple problems. Okay, any question? Great, okay. I think we can uh, stop a little earlier, like two minutes. Um, and uh, uh, on Thursday, we're gonna talk about uh, the logistic regression.
it's very similar to uh, linear regression, except that you need to uh, deal with the uh, calculation of the log probability. Right? 